Before we get to your scheduled video, please remember that likes and comments tell YouTube to promote our work to other people, and subscribing to the channel tells you when something new drops. You can also head to the link tree in the description to peruse my books, join us on Discord, or support us on Patreon. You can get episodes of Journey of Wrestling and Violent Profiles early, as well as a load of other treats. Even just a dollar a month earns you a name drop for being cool. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the show. Greetings and salutations, fellow novelty anthropomorphic NES cartridges. It is I, Eric J. Chucky, joined as always by... the boy. Hey! This is the Two Nerds Podcast, and before we get into uh, March, at least, of 1994 in film, I'd like to talk about who's cool. Who's cool? Uh, uh, today I'm going to say a guy from Ohio, mm -hmm. Harmony, mm -hmm. uh, Distrucity KTL, mm -hmm. Passion Killer 7-Eleven, oh. and Raw. Oh, they're good. Thank you. Um... This is Two Nerds Don't Go to the Movies. If you haven't watched or heard this before, um, go back to the first episode. We explain everything about it there. These are movies from the 90s, and we talk about whether we saw them or not and why. And if we haven't seen them, whether or not we'd like to. Uh, part of that reason is that my co-host here was five at the time. Yep. <laughs> and I was ten. So, uh, no, nine. Uh, hell, might be nine and I'm that old. I, I don't know how to do math. So, let's just dive into this. Uh, Angie has Gina Davis in it, so I don't know why I didn't watch it. Uh, it's a romantic comedy drama. That's why I didn't watch it. I was but a child. And I didn't watch it because I was a smaller child, and then I didn't watch it later because it's a romantic comedy. It, it feels so stereotypical to be like, I'm not really into those, but... I'm not really, I'm into, not those. really into those. <laughs> I've seen a bunch I like. Miss Congeniality is uh, legendary, but... Um, I don't know. It looks like it might be okay. Uh, it's got Gina Davis in it. Yep. Um, like, pass. <laughs> the Chase. This is a speed ripoff. <laughs> yeah, it's an action comedy uh, with Charlie Sheen. Um, let's see. A wrongfully convicted man who kidnaps what? a wealthy heiress and leads police on a lengthy car chase in an attempt to escape prison while the news media dramatize the chase to absurd extents. This might have been before Speed. I don't remember when Speed came it, out. It features Henry Rollins. Oh, well, that's neat. He actually has a lot of roles in movies where you don't expect him. He was in Bad Boys 2. <laughs> uh, is this... When was OJ? This may, have been, this may have been an OJ parody movie. I'm not going to Google remember. it. Oh, it, oh. it was released before OJ's infamous white Bronco chase. It predicted it, it, OJ. It was considered ahead of its time, actually. Yeah. Please tell me they were in a white Bronco. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't know. A lengthy car chase. It says. Um, oh dang. I don't. Yeah. Oh well. I'm still not going to watch it. To be clear. No. Yeah. I'm not a huge Charlie Sheen fan. Um, China Moon. Uh, a romantic thriller with Ed Harris, Madeline Stowe, and Benicio Del Toro, who apparently existed before Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. You wouldn't think so, but he did. I didn't think so. Um, it was filmed in 1991, but shelved for three years. Uh, I don't know. Look at the cover, man. To me, Ed, Ed Harris is always... That's his name? My brain already forgot it. Yeah, Ed, Ed Harris. Let's look yeah. at Ed Harris's head. He's always going to be the guy, uh, the general from The Stand, or the director from The Truman Show. Those those are who Ed Harris is to me. Him as the lead in a romantic movie seems incorrect. <laughs> I, I hesitate to say that my feeling is Ed Harris is unfuckable. Because I don't think that's true. But I just think maybe his romantic life doesn't seem like it would be very interesting. I have no feelings on the matter. Uh, so let's move along to Greedy. Um, uh, romantic thrillers. That's interesting, actually. Let's go back to that for just a second. There's a lot of romantic thrillers coming out in... The 90s. It's in this month in the 90s, even. So far, it's all been romantic thrillers and romantic comedies. Mm, this was an action comedy. I guess maybe there's a romance, but uh, uh, this is just a comedy, greedy. But I, I don't like uh, romantic uh, thrillers very much because I don't care. 
like oftentimes the central characters aren't super compelling and like i don't want to see them make it through whatever terrorism is happening to them <laughs> i mean you know in the general way as in like don't receive a terrorism that's nice but uh, i'm not i'm not a big actor guy i never really have been like there's exceptions you know i went through my johnny depp phase like anyone else but uh i'm not compelled to just go to the movie and be like oh uh, uh nancy travis is being assaulted in this movie i want to see if she makes it that's fair I, it, that's not really a compelling premise for me either no it's like i'm sure like i'm not i'm not hating on people who's who do like these movies i think that's perfectly fine like what sure, you like yeah but boy howdy does it make me not give a shit <laughs> well and that's the problem with romantic comedies a lot i i like comedy and i like romance but like the genre typically has a lot of tropes and uses them that i hate and that's basically my my feeling on romantic comedies as well is there's a lot of stuff that usually happens in a romantic comedy that i that like and it creates the same physical, physiological reaction in me as, like, a dentist drill. <laughs> it's like cringe humor, except I'm not laughing. Yeah, it's not funny. It's cringe anger. It's just secondhand, <laughs> I don't want to be here. Uh, but moving on to Greedy, uh, a comedy starring Michael J. Fox, Kirk Douglas, and, oh, there's Nancy Travis. It's almost like I pulled that name off the screen. Uh, Olivia Diabo, Phil Hartman, Ed Begley Jr., and Colleen Camp. Um, it looks like somebody dies. This is shitty people being shitty to each other, yeah. but but you're supposed to be laughing. And it might be funny, I don't know. I don't but, know. like, that's the premise, is there's an old guy, he's about to die. He's about to die, man. And, every, and a bunch of younger relatives are all fucking being the real housewives at each other to try and get the money. I, I don't care. You like if I saw a trailer, I might feel differently. I might be like, "Oh, that looks funny." But well, like, that's the thing with comedy movies; they're almost always going to be dependent on the jokes, right? And I, we don't see the jokes here, so and knowing the era in which it was made and the actors who which are in it, jokes probably aren't funny. <laughs> uh, Sirens is based on the life of artist and author Norman Lindsay, uh, set in Australia during the interwar period. Um, and it was part of the reason that Hugh Grant was... A thing. Yeah. Well, we have this movie to blame for Hugh Grant. Uh, this movie is retroactively, respon retroactively responsible for the uh, most recent Willy Wonka movies, Oompa Loompas. Sirens is the reason this happened. I'm going to blame Four Weddings and a Funeral a little more. It was more popular. Agreed. Okay. I hate that movie anyway, so co-signed. Um, I don't. I don't know about this artist, so I don't know that I care. You know, let's check him out. Does he have any good pictures? Oh, okay. Yeah, not bad. I got a booby lady statue. I'm slightly more interested now, maybe, in looking at this guy's art. But hey, four weddings and a funeral. <laughs> I don't like this movie. I've never seen it. Uh, I haven't seen all of it because it was on when I was a kid, and I left... I left the room to go be in my room doing nothing. <laughs> As opposed to continue watching Four Weddings and a Funeral. You know what? I think I confused this money, this movie with Five Heads in a Duffel Bag. Oh no, Five Heads in a Duffel Bag is an all-time classic. Yeah, and Andy McDowell I don't think was in that one. Um, I have no... I, 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 I mean, I was a child at the time. Maybe it's hilarious and it went over my head. But I, re I distinctly remember choosing to do nothing as opposed to continue watching this movie. I know this film in title only. I didn't even know Hugh Grant was in it. Like, that's... I, I've seen the title in parodies of stuff. Uh, we move on to Guarding Tess. Starring Shirley MacLaine and Nicholas K. I already watched All right, well, that. I mean, this sounds great. <laughs> So this is first kid, but instead of Sinbad, it's Nicolas Cage. <laughs> and instead of a child, it's the first lady. Yeah, that sounds really fun. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, I do add this to the list. Yeah, we'll keep that up to put it on the list later. That's That sounds like a, a That's, hell of a time. Ah, uh, the Hudsucker Proxy. Boy, do I know what, not know what the fuck this is. 
Um, Tim Robbins is a naive but ambitious business school graduate who is installed as the president of a manufacturing company. Jennifer Jason Lee is a newspaper reporter, and Paul Newman is a company director who hires the graduate as part of a stock scam. Uh, it, I've Tim never Robbins seen it. is usually pretty funny. Yeah, it's a screwball comedy uh, directed by the Coens, and Ooh. Sam Raimi co-wrote the script. Maybe not then. <laughs> Uh, I remember seeing some clips from it, and it's it, it is pretty much what it is. Um, I just the, the the term screwball comedy normally presages a movie I'm not gonna have a great time with. Uh, it, I, it's hit or miss. It's a flip of a coin. I feel it depends on um, where it's coming from. Uh, Lightning Jack. Oh, I remember oh, the ads is, for this. This is when we were trying to make Paul Hogan a thing. <laughs> well, he was a thing. But no, no, this is... I think this must be after Crocodile Dundee. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. This is when we were trying to make him a, like an actual thing as opposed to just, oh, look, it's Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> right. It was kind of coasting on his popularity at the time because this is at the point where we were just sailing out of the Aussie explosion. Yeah. Um, I, I do remember seeing ads for this. Paul Hogan, Cuba Gooding Jr., um, he's an Australian outlaw in the American West. It's, it, hijinks ensue. Uh, and Beverly D'Angelo. I can't, you know, gotta talk about all the people in blue. Uh, why didn't I see it? I was a little young at the time. Um, why haven't I seen it since? I don't know. This is a Western and Crocodile Dundee's in it. I'm 90% sure I've seen this movie. I have no memory of it. I just know the people who were in charge of playing movies at my house when I was a kid. And Paul Hogan and Western are pretty much A and B. <laughs> Cuba Gooding Jr. has to sn suck snake venom out of his ass. I, I have no memory of this, but I'm 90% sure I've seen this movie. Uh, the Ref. I've seen this. It's excellent. Oh, really? Uh, Dennis Leary, Judy Davis, Kevin Spacey, and Glynis Johns. What a name. I like that. Um, black comedy? Oh, why don't you tell us about it? So, uh, The Ref is essentially... It is a very simple plot. The two people in the tied up, uh, tied up in that little poster that you can see are a couple who are a stereotypical 90s. These people clearly fucking despise each other but refuse to get divorced for some reason. Couple. Uh... Dennis Leary is a criminal who is trying to uh, basically steal some jewelry from, like, a mansion. And he takes them hostage and is forced to fucking deal with them. <laughs> that sounds pretty funny. And he's Dennis Leary about it. That sounds pretty That's funny. That's the joke. Is Dennis Leary is Dennis Leary at insufferable dickheads for 90 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, all right. That's uh, I dig that. Yeah, it's great. Uh, honestly, it is an excellent film. I love it. The Silence of the Hams. I already know I'm going to hate this. I need to know nothing else about it. I can see the poster. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a parody of Silence of the Lambs and Psycho. Dom DeLuise, Billy Zane, Joanna Pacula, Charlene Tilton, and Martin Balsam. Uh, which is a... Truly the movie. Avengers of the early 90s. Yeah, definitely. Uh... Tom DeLuise and Billy Zane is very fascinating to me. Uh, it's it's a pair. I, I don't care. I, uh, I don't. Nope. Uh, de declined. Firmly and finally. I feel like I'm out of the point in my life where I care to watch a parody film. Like a skit on a show. That's one thing. Maybe even a whole episode. But not not a whole film. I'm, I'm good. Uh, Bitter Moon. Not to be confused with, with China Moon up here. Lots of moons. Moon. Lots of moons in, in the 90s. In one month here. Uh, erotic romantic thriller directed by Roman Polanski. Well, no! Uh, I'm out. Uh, Starring <laughs> Peter is... Coyote, Emmanuel Siegner, Hugh Grant, and Christian Scott Tuck. If this is If this is Shark Tank, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's why I didn't watch it back in the 90s. I don't think I would have been allowed to watch an erotic romantic thriller. Um, uh, I, I don't care. Yeah. I, I don't care enough to wage your morals on that one. Monkey Trouble. I remember the ads for this, too. I've absolutely seen this movie. Uh, Thora Birch and Harvey Keitel. Uh, I guess Harvey Keitel was the monkey. <laughs> uh, Harvey Keitel is, uh, to memory, the bad guy trying to hunt and or capture the monkey. Why did you have to ruin this for me? Uh, because I am a ruiner of things. Okay. I've stolen your title. Okay. Um, a little girl has a monkey. and That's the plot of the movie. The monkey steals shit. I, this is one of a thousand... This is one of several... 
to not to be non hyperbolic, probably like five pers- little kid with a monkey movies I've seen at like four a.m. on Stars. <laughs> Not a fan of Little Kid with the Monkey movies. Me. There's so many. There's so many more than you think there are. <laughs> uh, Naked Gun, 33 and a third, the final insult. I've probably seen parts of this. Um, I'm not really a fan of the franchise. It's okay. Uh, there's some good jokes. It's a parody. It, it is... The Naked Gun is, like, of an older school of parody. Yes. Where... When you could just make a parody movie. Yeah, it's, it's not, like, trying to be political satire. It's not... It's just... Really fucking silly. It's just very silly. There's not even really many jokes. It's just silly things happen. Like kind of a boring Looney Tune. <laughs> yeah, like a Looney Tune for like adults, I guess. Who, who want a plot. Uh, and and like, kind of chuckle worthy humor. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm all set on those forever. Um, yeah, and that was the last film. So you don't have to worry about ever seeing it again. Uh, the paper, a uh, comedy drama directed by Ron Howard, starring Michael Keaton, Glenn Close, Marissa Tomei, Randy Quaid, and Robert Duvall, received an Academy Award nom for Best Original Song, depicts a hectic 24 hours in a newspaper editor's professional and personal life. The main story of the day is two businessmen found murdered in a parked car in New York City. The reporters discover a police cover-up of evidence that teenage suspects in custody are innocent and rush to scoop the story in the midst of professional, private, and financial chaos. So this actually might be the early 90s Avengers, first off. Yeah. Uh, secondly, this sounds good. <laughs> it sounds good, but I don't know that I want to watch it. I, I, no, I know I don't want to watch it, but it does sound really good. If I accidentally watched it, I'd probably walk away like, that was pretty fucking good. Yeah. That and was... I wouldn't shut up about it for like the next two weeks. <laughs> yeah, I would, we would do a podcast on it. Uh, be that or I'd be, we'd be doing a different podcast. And I'd be like, you know, that reminds me, I watched this movie, The Paper. And uh, it's this really cool concept. No, I don't. I don't care. I'm not going to seek it out. Uh, Above the rim. That's a sports ball movie. Yeah, sports drama. Um, stars Dwayne Martin, Tupac Shakur, Leon, and Marlon Wayans. Considered to the conclusion to Cooper's Harlem trilogy. Oh, really? Uh, preceding New Jack City and Sugar Hill. The film tells a story about a promising New York City high school basketball star in his relations with a drug dealer and a former basketball star, now employed as a security guard at the high school. He was a promising young star at years ago. Star, 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 star. This seems like it's real good, but like I gotta be in a certain mood for sports movies. And just drama. I don't know, man. I don't like to be brought down anymore. It was probably fine. Uh, yeah, know, it seems like it was probably yeah, very good. Yeah, probably. But no thanks. Um, D2, The Mighty Ducks. Now, this is a sports movie I'm in the mood for. <laughs> um, God. This movie fucking rules. <laughs> I, I have, this this movie was big in my childhood. I have very firm memories of being invited to go see a Mighty Ducks movie with my grandma and the guy she was with at the time. And I, because I was young and I didn't understand that my grandma was trying to spend time with me, I was like, oh, no, thank you. Yeah, that I sounds dumb. Hurt, I, I don't that care probably about, hurt her feelings. Yeah, I don't care about the <laughs> Mighty Ducks. Uh... And I still don't care about the Mighty Ducks. I don't care about the movie. I care more about the the animated show where they were superheroes. No, dude, the Mighty Ducks is great. Like, I haven't seen it since I was a kid, but I remember when I was a kid really liking this movie. I'm pretty sure this is the movie with Keenan in it. Um, Emilio Estevez, Joshua Jackson, Eldon Henson, Sean Weiss, Brandon Adams, Matt Doherty... Garrett Ratliff Henson, Marguerite Moreau, Vincent LaRusso, Brock Pierce, Robert Hall, and Bob Miller, with Michael Tucker, Jan Rubes, and Catherine Irby joining the cast. Maybe no. he could, maybe he shows up in D three. I thought it was this one though. I can't remember. That's hmm. Um, but I just check real quick here. You can talk about Mighty Ducks. I'll look. I the Mighty Ducks. Keenan. Yeah. So he must have shown up in three. Okay. Uh, but I, I really, I, I never really saw the first one till I was a little older. I, l- hilariously... As I understand it, the first one's a little more serious and earnest. The, the first one was actually a very earnest, like, Bad News Bears sort of vibe. Um, if you've ever seen the original Bad News Bears, uh, it's, it's not about, it's much more about, um, the... I assume you mean the movie, not the series. Yes. Uh, it, it's much more about the, um, main character... Emilio Estevez, the, the coach, 
um, bonding with the the very the much smaller kids in their pee wee hockey thing. Just and it's like much more wholesome, earnest sports movie with like some heart. Uh, starting at D two and then later in D three, it got it got nineties kids movie wild, and I loved it. <laughs> Cause I, I like I this was the first one I saw. I didn't see the first one until, like I said, when I was a little older. Uh, I God, I can't even really summarize the plot at this point. I just remember that I loved it. <laughs> I think that's good enough for for this show. Uh, Against the Wall, um, starring Samuel L. Jackson and Kyle MacLachlan. I am interested. Uh, it was an HBO movie. Won a primetime Emmy. It is a docudrama about the four-day Attica prison riot uh, at the correctional facility. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would definitely win an Emmy. <laughs> yeah. And with probably really good acting. Uh, okay, I don't know that I want to watch it, but I'm Again, I'm this looks like very good. Yeah. Class of 1999 to The Substitute. Uh, Direct-to-video film about a new teacher at a troubled inner-city school... Where the students are all involved in gangs, drugs, and violence. Um, the movie is the third in the series. It began with Class of 1984 and Class of 1999. Uh, only loosely related to each other. They're like an anthology series. Is it? Is it? I've, I, I'm, I want to reach these kids the anthology series? It sounds like it. Why is that an anthology? That's... I'm so confused. <laughs> it was a big thing back then. God, it really was, I bet. Okay. Yeah, there were a lot of lot of movies that were Teachers like that. trying to reach inner city kids. And that's why we, we laugh about it today, because what what? Uh Jimmy Hollywood is a comedy, um starring Joe Pesci and Christian Slater. That sounds fun. Released on April Fool's Day was a box office bomb. That's... That has since gained a cult following. Well, that's pretty common for movies in this era. Uh, Jimmy Alto is a failed actor living in Los Angeles after increasing frustration with his career going nowhere and crime within the city. Uh, he, along with his spaced-out best friend William, decide to take the law into their own hands. And becomes a mock vigilante group that videotapes criminals and turns them over to the police. This might be good. Wait, what, what genre is this? It's a comedy. This might be really this funny. Might be really funny. I don't know anybody else in the cast. I, Barry Levinson, I guess. But Harrison G- Ford. To oh. be clear, the the uh, leader of the mock vigilante group and and main character isn't Christian Slater. It's Joe Pesci. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, William is is Christian Slater, the spaced out guy. I. We'll leave it up. We'll, uh, leave, it we'll up leave it this. I, yeah, I don't know if I'll ever good. get to this, but I don't know. This seems interesting. Like the rest of the movies on the list? Yeah. We watched one and haven't gone back. And well, it, it, was looked, it was a really bad first impression. Our instincts did not pan out. All right. Major League Two. Back to the minors. Um, or is that three? I think that might be three. Uh, second installment in the series. Uh, you know, because it does it show. Can I click? No, I can't. I'm not allowed. Um, most of the same class from cast from the original, including Charlie Sheen, Tom Berenger, Corbin Burnson, uh, Wesley Snipes is gone. Uh, Omar Epps took over the role. David Keith is here. Um, a bunch of other people. It's a baseball, screwball, sports comedy. It is most notable in our modern day with our particular audience for being the reason this movie, um, and... Oh, well, this movie series uh, being the reason that John Moxley's music is wild thing. <laughs> I'm never going to watch it. <laughs> Fuck you, Major League Two. Uh, Thumbelina, last mm, pertinent release of this is, a, this is a Don Bluth movie, right? It is. It is. Um, Jody Benson uh, is basically... Oh, and John Hurt. Chato. Carol Channing. Yeah, that's some Don Bluth action. Um, I've actually seen this. I don't know if the listener knows about this in Spanish. You know what? We got some time to fill. Yeah. Why don't you tell the we... listener about your Spanish class and the origins for your strange sequence of only seeing classic kids movies in Spanish? Well, okay. So, uh, the ass half of the Disney renaissance, um, the Disney downturn, if you will... 
Uh, I was old enough that I didn't care. I think the last Disney movie I saw in theaters that I was really thrilled by was The Lion King, and I fell out of love with it pretty fast because it was just so everywhere that it started to get annoying. So I don't really think I went to see another film after that. Maybe Nightmare Before Christmas. I don't remember the timeline. Um, I, it was like Pocahontas didn't see it. Hercules didn't see it. Mulan didn't see it. Until, uh, like, six years later, um, when I was in high school. And I was in a lot of Spanish classes because I misunderstood what I needed to graduate. And I was taking extra credits that I did not require because I never checked up on it afterward. Uh, so every year I took a Spanish class. And I was actually the only uh, student in the highest tier Spanish class my senior year. Um, so I just kind of sat in with another class and sometimes wrote lessons for him and stuff. But uh, I want to play. I wrote a play. Uh, but um, we would watch a lot of videos when it was relax time. Because you know how that is. It's usually your science teacher wheels in Bill Nye kind of thing. And in many schools, the Spanish teacher is also the science teacher or English teacher or some other thing. So they're tired. Yeah, well, they were. it was separate here. But, you know, sometimes you just had a... Maybe you earned a, a relaxing day by doing well on a test or something or whatever. If you guys are good, we'll watch X. Yeah. And Espanol, of course. And Espanol because uh, it's Spanish. Claro que sí. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, among those films were Hercules, A uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Um, Mulan. Mulan, yes. Uh, I want to say Pocahontas. I, I don't know if I paid too much attention to that one. Uh, I've actually seen Hercules several times in Spanish. Um, and uh, Thumbelina. Um, I understood about half of it. Uh, I have... we uh, To date, I have not gotten him to actually watch Mulan or Hercules in English, and I'm upset about it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember the ads for this at the time. Uh, it looked... Annoying. I think the only Don Bluth movie I've ever seen is The Brave Little Toaster. That wasn't him. Oh, Rockadoodle? That was him. Rockadoodle. Because I know I've seen both of those, and I was pretty sure one of them was a Don Bluth movie. You uh, you haven't seen The Secret of Nim? Oh, uh, I know I've seen The Secret of Nim too. Okay. I think I've seen The Secret of Nim, but it would have been when I was so little that I don't remember it. Because I kind of rec I kind of understood what was happening in the sequel, which tells me I probably watched the original, but I don't have that data anymore. So the thing about Don Bluth films is most of them are bad, um, but the animation is usually exquisite. Uh, it's what he did best. Um, he's his story is the underdog story of animating. It's very compelling history. I've, I've watched a couple documentaries on it. Um, I love non-Disney animators. I love Disney animated stuff too, don't get me wrong, but like... It's a different vibe. It is a different vibe, and it's always so weird and off-putting, and um, I really loved how The Secret of Nim used, used really muted colors to convey the, the dire situation they were in, and that's a lot of Don Bluth stuff, but uh, like that's probably the best Don Bluth film. Someone might argue Anastasia. Um, there was a little rat lady with a medallion and a big ass owl named Nicodemus. Uh, the owl is a different guy. Nicodemus was a rat. And uh, technically, uh, Mrs. Frisbee was a mouse. Okay. Yeah, I know. Uh, very small when I saw this. I, we have sugar packets left. <laughs> uh, all dogs go to heaven, also. Oh, well, uh, then I've seen fun. that too. Yeah. Um, Formative, uh, in a way that I didn't fully understand at the time. Uh, I am, <laughs> I'm filling time here because the march was pretty big. Uh, and we don't really have enough time in the podcast I mean, to, to go. get through so all let's, of April. Let's talk. Let's talk about the general vibe of this particular. This is a very. This is what this is post Oscar season, right? I have no idea. I appreciate uh, that you think I do. I'm trying to figure out why there were. Like, there was a specific vibe to the movies that came out in this month. I don't know if things were streamlined enough by then, dude. Like, I mean, yeah, you had your Oscar bids and stuff. You know, that was still a thing that had been a thing since the 60s. Uh, but, like, 
we just sort of put out movies. Like a lot of the, you know, oh, it's January and February, release horror movies nobody cared about. That wasn't a thing back then, really. Interesting. When did that become a thing? I'm not sure. I guess we'll find out the longer we go on in this series. Um, it, I want to say the 2000s, I'm going to guess. Uh, because, you know, in, in the 80s and the early 90s, horror movies and slashers and stuff were still on vogue. So it, they were popular. You would release them when they'd get numbers. Not just put it in fucking January and we'll do our best. It's fine. There will be nothing else in the theater, so maybe people will go see it. Um, so there had to have been the late 90s, early 2000s dips, maybe the late 2000s, 20 teens. Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, I'm not an expert on these kinds of things. Uh, I simply Google them on the internet. <laughs>